Okay, welcome back everybody to our second hour on uh, in this course, PC308, our second lecture for today. We are continuing journeying through Revelation. We are now in Revelation chapter 16. Um, yeah, just uh, any questions till now before we proceed? Any questions from what we covered in the previous lecture, previous hour? Any questions? Okay. So, the sixth bowl is really the signal for preparations to take place for this great and final battle. I shouldn't say great, but it is the final battle. What you know, we may call World War Three or whatever, but it's the final battle, the Battle of Armageddon. And we're seeing how it's the preparations begin. River Euphrates dries up, demonic spirits are released the, through the mouth of the Antichrist and the false prophet, meaning they instigate the kings of the East to begin to uh, come and all armies of the earth to come. So that's there's a build up towards it. And then we see the climax, the Battle of Armageddon, which will take place. By the time we come to Revelation uh, 19, that's the Battle of Armageddon, right? So. Revelation 16 is the beginning for the build-up of that final battle of Armageddon. Then the next bowl, that uh, Revelation chapter 16, verses 17 to 21. Somebody could read it. This is the seventh bowl. Somebody could read that, please. Then the seventh angel poured out his bowl into the air, and a loud voice came out of the temple of heaven. It is done, and there were noises and thunderings and lightnings. And there was a great earthquake, such a mighty and great earthquake as had not occurred since men were on the earth. Now the great city was divided into three parts, and the cities of the nations fell, and a great Babylon was remembered before God to give her the cup of wine of the of the fastness of his wrath. You can read the next two verses also, Abhinas. Yeah, verse 17. Then every island fled away, and the mountains were not found, and great hail from heaven fell upon man, each hailstone about the weight of a talent, Men blasphemed God before of the plague of, of the hell, since that plague was exceedingly great. Hmm. So, seventh bow. This is it. Last one. This judgment is poured out. There are all kinds of things happening in the atmosphere. All kinds of... There's uh, thunderings, lightnings, uh, and uh, the weather conditions, there's earthquakes, cities are shaken. Cities are shaken. To the point where even the great city of Jerusalem, three parts. So you just have to imagine an earthquake that just divides the city into three parts. I mean, nations all over the world. It's a global shaking. Atmospheric weather conditions are shaking the earth. This is it. This is the last one. But it also signifies something. God is going to judge Babylon, says there. And great Babylon was remembered. God is going to judge Babylon. And we will talk about that. We'll talk about that. But the human response is they're just angry with God. It says men blasphemed God. Seventh judgment has been poured out. It's the last one. It's done. Nations are shaken. Earth is shaken. People are angry with God. And there's one thing left. God is going to judge Babylon. Now, Babylon 
In the Bible, you'll find it used in three contexts. One, of course, Babylon is a literal city, literal place. Uh, in Iraq, uh, the physical place, the geography. But as we're going to see in the next two chapters, Babylon represents two things. Now, the word Babylon literally uh, means gateway to God. And it has the, it, the roots in, in the book of Genesis when people try to build a tower to reach God. Yeah. So they were, it was a man's attempt to reach God or scale the heights and become like God. But it also taught, means, literally means confusion because God caused people to be confused by giving different languages and they didn't understand each other. And they were dispersed. So Babel or Babylon signifies gateway to God, man trying to be like God. So Babylon, literally, there is a place, city, all of that. But in the next two chapters, we will see that right here at the end of the tribulation, and this is the final bowl, judgment, being poured out. And one thing remains, God is going to pour out his wrath on Babylon. Remember, we saw in chapter 15, that was it, yeah, uh, chapter 14, sorry, the angel announcing, Babylon is fallen, Babylon is fallen. Don't put your faith in Babylon, it's going to fall. Uh, that time has come. God is going to judge Babylon. What is Babylon? Two things. Chapter 17 it talks about mystery Babylon. Chapter 18 talks about the great city Babylon. And I'll just give us a heads up, a preview. Uh, and when we read it, we will understand it. Chapter 17, talking about the mystery Babylon, represents a world religious system, a false religion. And as you read it, you'll understand why. Because first of all, it's, it's called mystery Babylon. The word mystery is often used in connection with revelation, with something that's being unveiled. This mystery Babylon is referred to as a harlot, a prostitute, an adulterer. And she sits over the nations. Meaning she has influence over the whole people all over the world. Now, harlot in the Bible, both Old Testament and New Testament, is used to signify people who depart from God. They are spiritual harlots, they're adulterers, meaning they leave God for something else. So that language is used for this mystery Babylon. She's a harlot. She sits over the nations. And she persecutes the people who have the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. She kills them. So it's a religious system that is destroying those who hold the truth, the word of God. Mystery Babylon. And what we see in chapter 17 is, I'm just giving you a preview so when you read it, you understand, that initially, this mystery Babylon was supported by these 10 leaders, 10 world leaders. Remember, Daniel spoke about them, the, the 10 toes, the 10 horns, who are who were actually responsible for bringing the Antichrist into power. You know, the Antichrist, the little horn, he influenced these three horns and he overcame them and they pushed him up. So you read in chapter 17 here that these 10 leaders were all subscribing to this mystery Babylon, which basically was from being promoted by the Antichrist and the false prophet. 
but suddenly they withdraw their support and this whole world religious system collapses it's gone basically it's God judging this substitute something that took away or was was brought in as an attempt to take away worship from him the great city Babylon when we come to chapter 18 you will read again a preview so when you read you'll understand the great city Babylon which you can see very clearly in chapter 18 represents a global financial system a global financial system it was a system by which the nations were trading they were buying and selling and all over they were all trading and within one hour this Babylon which is the great city Babylon representing the gl a global financial system collapses within one hour and the wealth of the nations disappear just gone all the wealth just disappears so two things that attempt to replace God religion money mystery Babylon great city Babylon and God's final judgment is on these two things because they have tried to take the place of God and man thought he could you know ascend to be like God through these two things both gone okay when you read these chapters it'll become very clear so let's do it chapter 17 let's go through verses 1 to 6 please first oh, Christopher you have a question go ahead uh, yes Pastor. Yeah, I think we're Sort of, you know, comes to the end of the, um, the tribulation mm -hmm. and uh, the amount of you know destruction that has been put on the earth. And um, what I would like to just understand is, you know, when we look at the uh, the nature of God, and um, you know, we 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 always mention, you know, that God never never changes, mm -hmm. uh, but they looks they 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 there is seems to be two is part two facets of of god you know where you know we say god is love mm. and then there is also this 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 wrath of god uh which is you know that uh, that is actually now being uh, very you know sort of very visible right now you know uh, at this time um it is also there in the uh, in the old testament and then when Jesus came, it seemed to be, you know, that there was a lot more, uh, a lot of, um, I mean, a different way to get to, uh, get, you know, get to heaven. And, you know, we, we are now, you know, you know, we have a lot more uh, uh, ability to do that because you now we have the Holy Spirit and, you know, Jesus has, uh, has taken upon our, you know, our, our sin and, you know, uh, in a sense, you know, it's, 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 it's easier. Mm. And uh, we don't see that, you know, that the other side of God, um, which is obviously there. And um, I guess there's two questions. One is on the nature of God and the other part is that uh, because, you know, we were created in, in his image, um, there is also this uh, this sort of dual fa facet uh, aspect of, of human beings, you know, where there is this capability of, of great love. Uh, and there's also, uh, you know, this inherent, um, uh, you know, um, violent and, uh, you, know, uh, you know, aspect of, uh, of human beings and, uh, you know, the capability to, to, you know, to do, uh, uh, to be very, uh, to have a lot of anger and, you know, do things that are, you know, because of that anger. So I just wanted to uh, understand these two aspects of, uh, of uh, I mean, these two questions actually, yeah. Mm, mm, mm. Yeah. So the nature of God, uh, you know, um, has n never changed. It's always been the same, consistent. Now, it seemed like when, you know, in the Gospels and the Epistles, 
suddenly God changed because there's been so much emphasis on grace, compassion. But we must, now, we must not forget that when Jesus came, it was grace and truth. Right? So it wasn't just no law, but it was grace and truth. And if you look at the life of Jesus, you find that while he was gracious and compassionate towards the people, toward, towards the gentle crowd, but towards, you know, instance, towards the Pharisees, he was, you know, he just called them, you know, hypocrites. And, you know, so there was that expression of truth that was sometimes, uh, you could say, strong, you know, say, hey, you, you, you hypocrites, and you, you know what? What are you doing? And 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 he did speak about hell as well. You know, he said it's it's better for you to lose a limb than for one limb, or than for your whole body to be cast into hell. So while we do emphasize a lot on his grace and his healing and compassion and so on, the reality is Jesus did speak of the other things as well. Same thing when you come into the epistles. Uh, a lot of our teaching and preaching is emphasizing grace, but the Apostle Paul did in men's words. You know, I mean, for example, in uh, Romans 11.22, he said, consider the goodness and severity of God. You know? So if you look carefully through the epistles, you'll find that it's very balanced. That There is this pointing to the to the severity side of God. So, you know, while we preach so much on the goodness of God, which people do need to hear about, in the epistles, you also find the severity side of God. And Paul said, consider both the goodness and the severity of God, you know. And um, he said the goodness of God, Romans 2, the goodness of God leads us to repentance, you know. So there is that goodness leading us to repentance. So the nature of God has not changed, uh, just that our presentation, our preaching and teaching has emphasized a lot on the goodness in the, in the New Testament, uh, in the church, uh, you know, emphasized the goodness and so on. But if, you look care if we look carefully, uh, there is the other side also being presented throughout the Gospels and the Epistles, the goodness and the severity of God. And so here we are in, in the book of Revelation, where it is God's acts of judgment uh, uh, on sin, on sinfulness, and so on, bringing everything to a close. Right? So we're seeing that final act. So, and the, the focus is on that. It doesn't mean that God is not being kind or not being loving at this point. He is everything. He is grace and truth. He is love, he's also just. And so everything is being held together. But the emphasis, the focus here in, in the book of Revelation is this, the final judgment of God. And so that's why it looks as though God has ceased to be kind or compassionate. No, it's just what is being presented to us uh, makes us focus in on that. But he's still God of great compassion, God of great love, who in his justice, is executing the judgment that that is deserving upon sin and those who have rebelled against God. That's how I would respond, yeah. So just to add to that, uh, um, you know, when when, uh, when we say that, you know, human beings are, you know, capable of doing, you know, evil and uh, they are, uh, they, I mean, it is attributed to you know the, the sin that was that came from from Adam, and um, but I guess where I'm coming from is that um, there is already this aspect of um, you know severity that, that is there in in God, um, which is um, which would have come to 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 human beings. Because you were created in his image, so you know, is it is it is it is it the sin that came from Adam? I mean, is, is that is that is that uh, you know, capability to you know to do uh, uh, you know violent things attributed to the sin, or is it because it's inherent in us when we were created? So I think we can look at it like this. 
I, I understand what you're saying, the second part of your question, yeah, which I did not answer, actually. Um, I understand what you're saying. Uh, and I think we can look at it like this. See, the capacity for emotion is in God and it's also in man. And the capacity for emotion inherently is not wrong, is not sinful. For, you know, uh, love is an act of the will, but love is also an emotion, and love is also expressed through action. So there is the determination, there is the emotion, there is the action. It's all part of love. The same thing when it comes to anger. Anger is an emotion by itself. It's neutral. What determines what you know what determines whether that anger is right or wrong is what was the determination, what was the emotion, what was the expression of it, the action. So if I'm angry about a good thing, that what determines that anger is hey, I'm angry about a good thing. The emotion is it may stir me up to, you know, uh, into some positive thing like maybe pray or uh, intercede or do something good and the expression is the action I pray I do something good so what actually caused this whole thing anger an emotion but is it was ex expressed in a very positive way so when sin came in the the emotion and we're focusing on the emotion the emotion part of it of us was corrupted which means this capacity of determination of uh, emotion and expression was used for wrong things, sinful things. So the capacity for emotion inherently is not wrong. It's in God, it's in us. But sin corrupted it, meaning this whole you know, if you call it a me mechanism that's built in us, was now being used or is used for ungodly things. Whereas I can be, I can have emotion for very good things in a very positive way. And, and, and that's very helpful. That is part of who we are, right? You know, uh, somebody could have an emotion, you know, they want to win an event, they want to do something, they want to, they want to find a solution to a problem whatever see all of that is very positive use of emotion i hope that helps and you know we can develop this thought further but i hope this helps christopher yeah, yeah thank you i i i guess i don't i don't think i want to yeah prolong it yeah but mm -hmm. i mean i guess the good the real question which, uh, which you can address later or perhaps is uh, uh you know that um this it's not just now in the emotion now because you know there are actually acts that are happening right now uh because of the emotion and uh, this is obviously not happening because of sin, even by God, because God doesn't have any, there's no sin in, in, in God at all. So, yeah, may, maybe we can discuss that later, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Right, so this, this is coming out of the justice of God. God is uh, a just God. And, and whatever, whatever we are seeing happening in the book of Revelation is an expression of his justice. Good. Let's get into chapter 17. Let's read about Mystery Babylon. Three verses each, please. Let's go through it. Revelation chapter 17. Then one of the angels who had the seven words came and talked with me, saying to me, Come, I will show you the judgment of the great harlot who sits on many waters, with whom the kings of earth committed vilification and inhabitants, and the inhabitants of the earth were made drunk with the wine of her fornication. So he carried me away in the spirit to the wilderness. And I saw a woman sitting on a scarlet beast, which was full of names of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns. First four. First four onwards, somebody, please. Verse 4, it says, the woman was dressed in purple and scarlet and was glittering with gold, precious stones, and pearls. She held a golden cup in her hand filled with abominable things 
and the field of her adulteries. The name written on her forehead was Mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of prostitutes, and the abominations of the earth. And I saw that the woman was drunk with the blood of God's holy people, the blood of those who bore testimony of, to Jesus. When I saw her, I was greatly astonished. Well, seven on, thank you. For the angel said to me, Why did you marvel? I will tell you the mystery of the woman, woman and the beast that carries her, which has the seven heads and ten horns. The beast that you saw was and is and is not and will ascend out of the bottomless pit and go to perdition. And those who dwell on the earth will marvel whose names are not written in the book of life from the foundation of the world. When they see the beast that was and, and is not and kept is. Verse 9. Here is the mind uh, which has wisdom. The seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman sits. Shall I continue? Okay. Please. Thank you. Uh, there are also seven kings. Five have fallen, fallen one knees, and other has not yet come. And when he comes, he must continue a short time. The beast that was and is not. He is himself also the eighth, and he is of the seventh, and is going to perdition. Should I continue further? Thank you. Uh, yeah, somebody can read it. Somebody else. Was well on was. Uh, the ten horns which you saw are ten kings who have received received no kingdom as yet, but they receive authority for one hour as kings with the beast. These are of one mind, and they will give their power and authority to the beast. These will make war with the Lamb, and the Lamb will overcome them. For he is Lord of the Lords and King of the Kings. And those who are with him are called chosen and faithful. Then the angel said to me, the waters you saw where the prostitute sits are peoples, multitudes, nations, and languages. The beast and the ten horns you saw will hate the prostitute. They will bring her to ruin and leave her naked. They will eat her flesh and burn her with fire. For God has put it into their hearts to accomplish his purpose by agreeing to hand over to the beast their royal authority until God's words are fulfilled. The woman you saw is the great city that rules over the kings of the earth. OK, thank you. All right, very, very interesting chapter. Thank you. So John is being, try to imagine this, right? John is suddenly seeing this whole thing. He's taken into a wilderness. I mean, now the wilderness is very, interesting because it is the place of preparation the prophets of god uh, in the scripture in the scriptures the prophets of god were usually prepared in the wilderness and then brought into uh, into you know visibility when they were ready to start their ministry it's very interesting so here he's taking it this well and saying look something has been this, this mystery Babylon has been prepared and he sees this uh, you know he sees this harlot a prostitute a woman who's an arla, harlot he gets the understand this is an harlot and she's full of blasphemy verse 3 she's full of blasphemy and uh, it, it the very nature is fornication, adultery. It's, you know, we're talking about spiritual terms. So this is departing from God, going away from God. 
and blasphemy, speaking against God. So that's why we are saying, as you read this description, we can say, hey, look, this is a religious system. It's taking people away from God, causing people to rebel against God, go away from Him, speak things against Him. It's, it's this form of a religious system. And uh, other things that I tell other, you know, other things that we see about this woman is she sit was one. She's sitting upon many waters, and then explains to us in verse fifteen: the waters are the nations, people, or. Oh, that means this woman has been sitting over all of these people. Other things we can see, verse 6, about this woman is she has been drinking on the blood of the martyrs, meaning this is a system that has actually been fueled, or its, its life is coming from the death of the martyrs. People are being killed, and this is living on that. So again, he's saying it's a, it's a religious thing that's anti-Jesus, anti-Jesus, killing all these things. And what is happening is the beast, verse 7, the beast is carrying her. The beast is the Antichrist. He's the one who's, you know, being the main proponent of this mystery Babylon. And... She's supported by these ten horns, uh, which has the, so the beast is is one who's who's got great authority, seven heads, and ten horns being supported by these ten leaders. And yet he says, this this be this mystery Babylon that she, verses 9 to 11, that she has actually been sitting, she's not new, because these, she has been already there upon these seven mountains. Now, these mountains represent kingdoms. How do we know that? Daniel chapter 2. What did, we saw, what did we see in Daniel 2? And in the days of these kings, God, God himself, you know, we saw this big rock coming and destroying all these kingdoms and becoming a big mountain. And Daniel said, that's the kingdom. So a mountain represents a kingdom here. And he's saying here, this woman has been, you know, in the wilderness, has been supported over time by seven kings five have already fallen so remember this is with reference to john john's time five have fallen one is so what was is during john's time the roman five have fallen meaning five have come and gone five before john's time We've saw already the Assyrians, the Egypts, uh, the Babylonians, the Medes and Persians, the Greece. All of these kingdoms have already come and gone. One is, that is, what was is during John's time, the Romans. Other has not yet come, that is, the, six, um, the seventh. And the beast represents the eighth. So, this mystery Babylon has been in existence for quite a long time. Through five previous kingdoms, the sixth Babylonian kingdom, the seventh introduced by the beast, sorry, uh, fifth, the beast is the eighth. So, five previous, sixth one, eight, the one that was Roman, and one that is yet to come, which is the seventh, which represents in Daniel chapter two the loosely held 
empire that follows after the Roman Empire, the eighth, which was introduced by the Antichrist. So this mystery Babylon, which is this religious system, keeping people away from God and blasphemous, adulterous, taking people away from God, has been going on for all of this time. And she's going to be supported by the beast, who is then being held by these ten leaders. But what will come, what will happen is, verse 12, the ten kings are worse, they are going to give their power and authority to the beast. So these ten leaders are supporting this beast, the Antichrist. He's made promises to them, but they haven't received what he has promised to them. And they are at that point, they're making war with the lamb, verse 14, with the lamb and 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 uh, 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 so these are the people who are going to come against Christ. Okay, this is the final battle of Armageddon. But what's going to happen? Verse 16. The ten horns will hate the harlot. So something has changed. The ten leaders have supported the Antichrist. This harlot is riding on the support of the Antichrist. The ten leaders are waiting for what, you know, they've given their full support to the beast. And they are waiting to receive what he has promised. He said, look, you know, he, so you can imagine verse 12 and 13, how that would have transpired. The Antichrist would have said, hey guys, you ten of you, you're supporting me. I'm going to give you, you know, your kingdom. I'm going to give you all these things, all of that. So he's got their all support. They're waiting for to receive it. And the Antichrist is promoting this world religious system. But something happens. It says here, verse 16, the ten horns will hate the harlot and tear it down. Basically, they will go against this whole mystery Babylon, this religious system that was riding on the, uh, the shoulders of the Antichrist. And verse 17 says, because God turned their minds against the beast to fulfill his purpose. So God himself turns them, causing this mystery Babylon to fall, to be brought to desolation. So, this mystery Babylon, which the angel in Revelation 14 had announced, is going to fall. Babylon has fallen. This mystery Babylon, which is a religious system that was being promoted by the Antichrist and the false prophet, is brought to nothing, is made naked, made desolate, and burn with fire, verse 16. Basically, it's reduced to nothing. Because the, the people who were part of it, themselves turn against it. Now, I'll just make one comment and then we'll take Say's question. Now, many people have tried to say, what is this mystery Babylon? Okay, we understand it's a religious system by looking at, you know, observing these things, but it's been there five empires before the Roman Empire. It continues on in this loosely held empire of iron and clay. It is there, eighth, being supported by the eighth empire, which is, or the eighth kingdom, which is headed up by the Antichrist. It is there. But it had its origins way back 
is being supported. Now, what is this thing? Now, some people have tried to speculate, oh, this is, you know, some people have, you know, some books you'll find, oh, this is the Roman Catholic Church. Some people will write, okay, this is a new world religion, you know, when when the New Age movement was gaining momentum. Some people say, oh, this is the New Age movement. and But neither of these things, you know, really, yeah, you know, match these criteria that's described here in Revelation 70. So we're talking about a religious system that has its roots way back from Egypt, because five empires prior to the Roman Empire, right? The Assyrians, the Babylonians, the Medes and the Persians and the Greeks, all of them. Then came the Romans. Then comes this loosely held empire of iron and clay, and then comes this Antichrist. All of them have been carrying this religious system, Mystery Babylon, until finally it is ruined, brought to, brought to nothing. God judges it. So we don't know for sure, right? We don't, we, we can't say, okay, it's this particular religion. That uh, you know, some people even try to blame it on Islam or something. So people, you know, you'll you'll read different commentaries, different books, and uh, people have tried to say what it is. We don't know for sure because there's there's not one thing that actually fits all these criteria. But we know it is something, a religious system, that has tried to destroy the to those who were of faith and in from a spiritual sense taken people away from God. Okay. Say your question please. Uh, I'm sorry, Pastor. I, I, I think I got the answer, but I just wanted to be sure. So I, I, are we right to say that this mystery Babylon right now is operational in our time today and that there are certain world powers and quotes that have allegiance to this, this prostitute, this harlot, uh, harlot um, uh, right now in our time. Mm. Is that correct to say? Yes, yes. So, like you see it described here, it has its origins way back in time. Five empires before John. And is still sitting on the nations of the earth. Right. So it's, it has some sort of, it has the spiritual, global influence. And is everywhere, everywhere. So perhaps it is something beyond a particular religion. It's probably referring to a network of you know, I'm using a network because that's something, the language we understand. A, a, a cloud or a network of a demonic influence, global, because he says here in verse 15, it's over peoples, multitudes, nations, and tongues. I mean, this harlot is sitting over the waters, it's covering the earth. So perhaps it is referring to this demonic system that is behind world religious systems expressed in di that has diverse expressions everywhere perhaps is referring to that which we don't have a single name for it like we can't say it's this particular religion or this particular thing no 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 it's 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 global it's everywhere but she is sitting upon the waters influencing people all over the world and it has been there from five kingdoms before the Roman Empire. We see it here in verse 10. So it's continuing now, even during the time of the seventh, seventh, which is the iron and clay being mixed, which is during our days. And the eighth, which is Antichrist. So it's still continuing. 
So I'll answer to your question is yeah, it's there. Thank you, Master. Christopher. Oh uh, yes, Pastor. So right now we're in, we're in, as we are in as we are in Revelation seventeen. Um, mm -hmm. My understanding is that all this is happening in the future, right? Uh, um, and uh, but here there is a reference to there are, you know those uh, those uh, you know in, in John's time going back five 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 uh, uh, five generations or you know so I just want to understand how that sort of you know aligns with the what is happening in the future and yet going back to what the time of John. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so we we have seen this already in example in Revelation twelve, right? So remember. There, there are some things, so so the book of Revelation, in a sense, is about things to come. But there are always references to something that have happened. Example, Revelation 12, uh, before it starts telling us about what the devil is going to do, it tells us a little bit of history. You know, it points us to the nation of Israel, it points us to when Satan fell. So that's history, it already happened. Okay, so that dragon now, is going to be doing this, right? There's a little background. Same thing you're seeing here in Revelation 17, verse 9. He says, look, 17, 9, 10, 11, this Babylon, mystery Babylon, has been around. Seven mountains. Five of them are already there. One now is, I mean, the sixth one is what you are in right now. That is John. John was there. Sixth one. What is it? Your Roman, the Roman Empire. Right? So that was so five empires already come and gone. Sixth one, John, you're there, is to John's time. Seventh and eighth are going to come. So the five are historical. It's just pointing back. Yeah. So Revelation 17 talks about mystery Babylon, a religious system which God judges. This is closely connected to something called the city of Babylon, which is in chapter 18, which will also be judged. So let's just read a little bit how big is chapter 18 now. It's, um, we have a few more minutes before this. Okay. Yeah, let's read uh, uh, you know, as much as we can, maybe from verses 1 to 8, Revelation 18. Uh, we'll read verse 1 to 8, some take turns, three verses each. Now look yes. look at the difference. Go ahead, go ahead, uh, go ahead. After this, I saw another angel coming down from heaven, having great authority, and the earth was made bright with his glory. And he called out with a mighty voice, Fallen, fallen is Babylon the great. She has become a dwelling place for demons a hunt for every unclean spirit, a hunt for every unclean bird, a hunt for every unclean and detestable beast. For all nations have drunk, and the wine of the passion of her sexual immorality, and the kings of the earth have committed. The kings of the earth have grown rich from the power of her luxurious living. Mm. So as we read through this, let's look at you know, he's, now he's talking about something else. He's talking about merchants. He's talking about luxurious living. He's talking about becoming rich. So now the focus of this Babylon the Great or the city Babylon is different. It's about financials, financial system. Right? Verse 4 onwards, somebody. Then I heard another voice from heaven say, and I heard Come out of her, my people, so that you will not share in her sins, so that you will not receive any of her plagues. For her sins are piled up to heaven, and God has remembered her crimes. Give back to her as she has given. Pay her back double for what she has done. Pour her a double portion from her own cup. Give her as much torment and grief as the glory and luxury she gave herself. In her heart she boasts, I sit enthroned as queen. I am not a widow, 
I will never mourn. Therefore, in one day her plagues will overtake her, death, mourning, and famine. She will be consumed by fire, for mighty is the Lord of God who judges her. Thank you. Um, okay, let's just read. Uh, I think when you read the uh, verse 9 onwards, let's go on. You, you get a clear understanding of what mystery this Babylon the Great is. Three verses each, please. The king, the kings of the earth who committed for, uh, fornication and the luxuries, luxuriously with her, with her will weep and lament for her when they see the smoke of uh, burning standing at a distance for fear of her torment, saying, "Alas, alas, the great city, uh, great city Babylon, the mighty city, for in one hour your judgment has come." And the merchants of the earth will weep and mourn over her for for no one buys. Their merchandise anymore. Next three verses, somebody, please. Merchandise of gold and silver, precious stones and pearls, fine linen and purple, silk and scarlet, every kind of citron wood, every kind of object of ivory, every kind of object of most precious wood, bronze, iron, and marble, and cinnamon and incense. Fragrant oil and frankincense, wine and oil, fine flour and wheat, cattle and sheep, horses and chariots, and bodies and souls of men. The fruit that your soul longed for has gone from you, and all the things which are rich and splendid have gone from you, and you shall find them no more at all. Mm. Okay. Let's just read three more verses, please. Somebody. The merchants of these things who became rich by her will stand at a distance for fear of torment, weeping and wailing, and saying, Alas, alas, the great city that was clothed in fine linen, purple and scarlet, and adorned with gold and precious stones and pearls. For in one hour such great riches came to nothing. Every ship master, who all who travel by ship, sailors, and as many as trade on the sea, stood at a distance and cried out when they saw the smoke of her burning, saying, What is like this great city? Mm -hmm. So we will we will pause here uh, and just before we go a break, but what I want to just bring our, bring to our attention is, is very clear as you read this chapter, uh, Revelation 18, that this Babylon, the great city, or Babylon the Great, or the Babylon the Great City, is different from Mystery Babylon of Revelation 17, although both are closely interconnected. This great city, Babylon, is talking about an economic system. Of course, he's using the language of his day. He's talking about, you know, buying and selling and all of those kinds of things. The merchants, the traders on the sea. And, and he says, they all stand shocked. Because in one hour, verse 17, in one hour, such great riches came to nothing. So God's, so when Babylon is being judged at the end of the tribulation, there's a religious system that God judges, and there is an economic system that God brings to nothing. And uh, yeah, so we will pause here and we'll go for a break, come back, and we'll uh, we'll see how far we go. Okay, thank you. Come back in a few minutes. Thanks. <laughs> 